Shalom, this is Reverend John Ferret, and this is Truth Nugget 6. Our focus is going to be on the parable of the talents, and that's going to be in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. A little background, a close associate of mine recently asked me about this parable. We got into a discussion, and I gave him some thoughts and some ideas that I had with regards to the actual Hebraic background of this psalm. He got so interested, and I was fascinated with our discussion. I, I, I just had to do this in a podcast. So once again, we're going to go back to Second Temple Judaism, to the first century A.D., Jesus' day. And those people, those disciples of Jesus, they heard and saw things differently. Differently than us. It's a different culture. We're 2,000 years apart. So we want to put this parable back into its historical context. And thus to hear what Jesus' disciples heard then. So that we can understand more completely now. So let's uh, begin by reading through this parable. It's in Matthew 25, starting in verse 14 and going through 30. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted me, entrusted five talents to me. See, I've gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you've you entrusted me. Or you entrusted two talents to me. See, I've gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid. And went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave! You know that I reap where I do, did not sow, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival I would have received my money with, back with interest. Therefore take away the talent from him, and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to every one who has, more shall be given." and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we have to ask the question, and that's the first thing that we're going to ask, is what is the textual context of this parable? In other words, why is this put here? Well, you go to Matthew 25, verses 1 through 2, and when you do go to those verses, it talks about the fact that Jesus says, let me talk to you about the kingdom. 25, verse 1, Then the kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins. And that's where he starts. So what Jesus is saying, this is about the kingdom of God. Or... As in Jesus' day, the kingdom of God was also known as the kingdom of heaven. You talked about the kingdom of heaven, you're talking about the kingdom of God. They're similar. Now, I'm not going to go back and teach about the kingdom. If you want to go and learn more about that, I don't want to repeat myself. 
But you can find the podcast on the Lord's Prayer. It's Lesson 6 on the Lord's Prayer, Part 1 and Part 2. And I deal extensively with the idea of what the kingdom of God was to the Jewish people back in those days. So you can go to the website, lightofmenorah.org. You can, there's a little search window up there, and I've tried this myself. You can type the word in kingdom and hit search, and it will find those two lessons for you. Lesson 6, part 1 and part 2. And in those lessons, I deal extensively with what the kingdom is. In short, it's not a place, and it is totally separate from time. The kingdom, as the Jewish people understood it in Jesus' day, and the way Jesus taught it, it's the rule and reign of God as king. This is what they understood then. Now, as part of the kingdom, all religious Jews knew that Messiah is expected. So then all expected Messiah to come. So we get down to the second verse that shows us the textual context. This is Matthew 25, 13 through 14. Be on the alert, for you do not know the day nor the hour. In other words, you don't know the day or hour, obviously, when Messiah is coming, when Jesus is going to return. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. So this is the second verse that gives us the textual context. What's it going to be like when Messiah arrives, which is part of God's kingdom? The religious Jews, they're waiting for the promised Messiah. This, this was a huge part of that culture. For them, and the parable of the ten virgins, which precedes this one, is not focused, though, on the unexpected coming of the Messiah. It's on something more profound. It's, it's actually something more practical. It's more related to everyday life. Now for us, we Christians in the 21st century, what is it that we see in this parable? Again, I'm deeply indebted to Dr. Brad Young, a highly credible Bible scholar and teacher. He's one of of the main scholars who has helped me tremendously, especially with the Hebraic background of the Lord's Prayer. He wrote a book called The Parables. And in his book, I mean, it is just so awesome. And here, Brad Young, Dr. Brad Young, shows that all rabbis, Jesus was the best of them, they used parables. It was just part of how they taught. Many of them, are similar to Jesus' parable on the talents. Matter of fact, when you actually take a look at rabbinic parables, you'll find that a numbers of them are, again, closely associated to what Jesus is teaching. L let me give you an example. I'm going to go to Dr. Brad Young's book. And a rabbi was teaching on the concept of love and fear. This rabbi is trying to help us understand the difference by using a parable. So here is the parable. It's called Love and Fear of the King's Servant. What is the difference between love and fear? The distinction may be illustrated through means of a parable. To what may the master be compared? To a king who had two servants. One loved the king and feared him. The other feared the king, but did not love him. The king went into a far country. The servant who loved the king and feared him rose up to plant gardens, orchards, and all varieties of fruit. The servant who feared the king remained inactive and did nothing at all. Upon returning from the far country, the king saw the gardens, orchards, and many varieties of fruit arranged before him according to the design of the servant who loved him. When the one who loved the king came before him, he saw the many varieties of fruits arrayed before him. He was greatly contented in correspondence to the joy of the king. 
But when the king entered the domain of the servant who feared him but did not love him, he saw all the desolate grounds that lay before him according to the failure of the servant who feared him. When the one who feared the king came before him, he was greatly distressed in accordance with the anger of the king. Hence, you learn that the reward of the one who loved the king was a double portion, while the reward of the one who feared the king was only a single portion. This, this parable is pretty awesome only in the sense that again we're dealing with a king who left not really any indications of when he's going to return and his servants so this idea of a master and his servants a master and his slaves was a common theme in many rabbinical parables and jesus obviously is using one right here in the one that we call the parable of the talents. So again, we want to put Jesus' parable into its historical context. And this way it'll shed light on us so that our understanding is enhanced and enriched. Now, for Christians today, this parable for many seems to focus on Jesus's unexpected return. He basically said only the Father knows. He didn't even know. Also, many Christians today, they take a look at the word talents and they begin to actually attribute meaning to it that it's more than money. And they talk about our talents because this is what the word means today. Do you, know, you have a singing ability? Are you uh, one who knows how to build stuff and, and work like a carpenter? Are you great at business, an artist, a great cook? Another aspect of the way Christians look upon this parable of the talents, it talks about judgment is going to happen when Jesus returns. And so you have two servants that are rewarded since they invested their talents for God. And, and, and talents, again, here for many Christians means th their abilities, uh, their God-given abilities, whether they're a singer, a guitar player, um, a, a nurse, a great doctor, uh, a fantastic cook. And we have the one servant was punished and damned. So again, for Christians today, for many Christians today, the focus is on, it's like the, this, this parable is like um, a parable of a warning. You don't know when he's going to come, so you better take your talents and your abilities and use them for God because he's going to come and there's going to be judgment. However, if we look at it that way, there's an issue. When we look at this, it seems as if that these three servants of the master are all slaves or servants of this master who had favor with the master. He, he basically entrusted them with these talents because of their abilities. And according to their abilities, this master knew them. One might say that they're all Christians. Now, if so, we know that in Jesus we're saved by grace. This is in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Now, let me go to that. I want to read that because that's going to be playing an important role as we continue on with this podcast. So in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, we read, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, that it's a gift of God not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So, we know we've been saved by grace. Now, the problem comes in, in terms of a Christian view of this parable, where some, I'm not trying to say all of us, but a common way of looking at this parable, it's a warning, Jesus is going to come unexpectedly, we better be 
using our talents and abilities uh, for his purposes. Otherwise, judgment's going to come. So it's going to be th the fact that Jesus is coming and judgment is coming. And we want to be basically those where Jesus is going to say to us, well done. Now, here's where the problem comes in. If that's the case, the servant who only had one talent was damned. He was condemned. Now, if he would have done his work, he would have been rewarded. Matter of fact, all he had to do was take the one talent, put it in the bank, and get some little interest. If he did his work, he would have been saved. But this doesn't fit the truth of the gospel. This is the point that many of us miss. Now, as Christians, we'd expect from Jesus that he would look upon the servant with only one talent with compassion and understanding, and that he would forgive the servant with one talent. But the implication is Jesus didn't. The implication is the one is saved by his works, which contradicts Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. So, we ask, did religious Jews then hear the parable in the same way as Christians in the 21st century? Messiah is coming. When he's here at the end of the age, there's going to be judgment. Is the parable for them a warning like for many of us Christians? Must we work to be rewarded? Must we work to be saved? Something is wrong here in terms of the common way or one of the ways that many Christians look at this parable. So when we put the parable in its historical context, Jesus is teaching Jews then something that they understood. For them, it's not a warning of his return and the coming judgment. It's not a warning. When we hear what they heard, then our understanding is expanded and enriched. Let's go take a look. So in Second Temple Judaism, in Jesus' day, the first thing we have to mention, it's not about your talents or your abilities. Are you a good singer? Do you have talent in business? Or are, you, are you a great doctor in terms of healing, an artist? The talent here is money, a sum of money. Matter of fact, it's a weight. It's estimated by Dr. Brad Young that this could be 15 years wages for a day labor. This is about money. To help us a bit, a little bit more to understand the impact, let's talk about the talent as being a million dollars. It's a big sum of money. 15 years wages? So we got one of the servants, uh, slaves, gets $5 million entrusted to him, the other one $2 million, and uh, the third $1 million according to their ability. Now just as an aside, there are some today that actually use this parable today that God is teaching about the, correct, about the correct way of handling money, and that is investment. Invested in the stock market and, and invested in a 401k plan, you want your money to grow. Yes, the master returns and says to the one given one talent, or let's say $1 million, you could have put it in the bank. I would have gotten some interest. This is not about Jesus saying we should invest our money. This is a huge error. If one says it's about how we should invest our money, then the parable is taken out of context. We already said that in the textual context, in Matthew 25, 1, it's about the kingdom of God. Second of all, Matthew 25, 13 through 14, it's about the Messiah coming. This is part of the kingdom. The parable is related to the events because Jesus said, my coming, the coming of the kingdom can be compared to this. And then he goes into the parable of the talents. This is about you're growing your estate? Are you kidding? Remember Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9? In there, 
what we read is about storing up our treasures in heaven rather than here on earth. Store up. The Greek word there means to gather, to heap up. The implication is investing. In other words, taking what you've got and have, heaping it up, making it grow. But then later on in that section, in Matthew 6, 21, Jesus gives us a warning. Wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be as well. So quite definitely, this is not about investing. If it was, this, it's, it's just another example of a typical, immature Christian misuse of God's Word. Because it's taken out of textual context. And people who actually use it for investing purposes are actually misusing God's Word. Now, for Jews, then, it's all about living as God's true servant. This is the bottom line for them. How do you live as God's true believer, a true son or daughter of the Lord God in everyday life? For us, we might say Jesus is teaching this to his disciples. Matter of fact, he is. Matthew 24, 1, that's where all of this starts. Matthew 24 and 25. Jesus is only teaching his disciples, and they're on the Mount of Olives, just the 12. And so, for the Jews, then, Jesus' teaching, what does it mean to be a true disciple of Jesus? What's expected of us daily, every day? parable of the talents to the Jewish people in Jesus' name is not a warning of Messiah's coming in judgment. Religious Jews know that the Messiah's coming. The religious Jews of Jesus' day know his coming is unexpected. And in the Old Testament, they know the Hebrew Scriptures, that judgment is coming. They know this. They've been prepared. They don't have to have anybody teach them this. For example, example in Ezekiel 7, in verses 7 through 8, Your doom has come to you, O inhabitant of the land. The time has come. The day is near. Tumult rather than joyful shouting on the mountains. Now I will surely pour out my wrath on you and spend my anger against you. Judge you according to your ways and bring on you all your abominations. My eye will show no pity, nor will I spare. I will repay you according to your ways, while your abominations are in your midst. Then you will know that I, the Lord, do the smiting. Or take a look at Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair on his head was like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. Oh, there's many other verses here about judgment coming. Jewish people in Jesus' day didn't need a warning. They got it. For them, they're saying, all of this is true. What we want to know then, and what they're concerned about, and what this parable is concerned about, is how are we to live? What are we to be like every day? What are we to be like in all circumstances? What are we to be like to all people? What does it mean to be a true believer? And for us, what we'd say, what does it mean to be a true disciple? The religious Jews... In Jesus' day, they likened this to Moses and David. And again, we're going to go back to Dr. Young's book on the parables. And there is a Jewish commentary on the book of Exodus. It's called Midrash Shemot Rabbah. And so in Midrash Shemot Rabbah, chapter 2, verse 3, now Moses was keeping the flock, as we read in Exodus 3, 1. It says, every word of God is tried. That's Proverbs 30, verse 5. 
before God confers greatness on a person, first he tests him by a little thing and then promotes him to greatness. Here you have two leaders whom God proved first by a little thing, found faithful, and then promoted them to greatness. He tested David with sheep. God said to him, you have been faithful with the sheep? Come therefore and tend my sheep. As it is said, from the ewes that gave suck, he brought him. This is in Psalm 78, starting in verse 70. Similarly, also in the case of Moses, it says, and he led the flock to the farthest end of the wilderness. God took him to tend Israel. As it is said, you did lead your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And that's in Psalm 77, verse 20. So, a true servant of God in the Jewish mind is somebody who lives faithfully each day. No matter what they're involved in, a small matter or a big matter, they're being faithful as God's servants to live according to God's will in all things. In other words, they're saying, don't just say you're a believer, show it. Now, in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, let's go back and see how this is related quite definitely to the concepts that you would find in the Hebrew Scriptures of the Old Testament. Now, in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, you're first saved by grace. Every Jew agrees on that. Every Jew in Jesus' day realized that we're saved by grace. They knew it then. Here's Paul teaching the same thing. You're saved by grace, not by works. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. But in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, and we're given good works. Now, the Greek word there not only means works, but it means occupation, a profession, a special endeavor or a special task. Now, get this. We, if we're truly saved, and we're truly saved by grace, if we're true Christians, we've been given special work to do. We've been given special tasks to do. We've been given an occupation. And our salvation is not dependent upon those works. We're saved by grace. So, we're servants of the king. Now serve him. This is a characteristic of who we are. Jesus puts it dramatically in another way. This is in Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, words, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Don't simply use words. Jesus is saying, don't, don't use words, show me. And remember, in John 15, the vine and the branches. Jesus is the vine. We become a branch after we're saved by grace. We're a new creature, a new growth, a new branch. But to be a real, true branch of the true vine, we need to be fruitful. And when you read John 15, Jesus says, yes, you need to be fruitful to show me that you're a true disciple. Now, another way of saying this, who are the true sons of Abraham? Paul teaches in Galatians 3, 7, that if you're a Christian, a real Christian, you're a son or a daughter of Abraham. Now, in Genesis 15, 6, we would remember, I'm reading this from the New American Standard, he believed in the Lord, believed in Yahweh, and this was, and thus he was considered righteous. But interesting, it says he believed in the Lord. We need to go to the Hebrew because it's not about believing in God. It's not about faith. It's not about his faith. The Hebrew word there is aman. The Strong's number is H539. And Amon means to lean on, to rely on, to base one's life upon. Your foundation of your life is based upon God and upon your trust in God. This is Abraham. 
What's God telling us if we're sons and daughters of Abraham? It's the same thing Jesus taught. He basically said, hey, just because you say, Lord, Lord, in your own words, telling me that you're a true believer, don't tell me, show me. True sons of Abraham, true disciples of Jesus, they live a life daily, continually, leaning and depending upon God. Abraham didn't sit there. God said, get up and go to the place that I will show you. Yes, Abraham again and again showed he was a true servant of God. God said, go. Abraham relied on God. He leaned on God. Aman in Yahweh, and he went. He acted. He did. He was the faithful servant of the Lord God Most High. So the parable of the talents basically asks this, are you a true loyal servant of the master? Are you? If so, you know that you are saved by grace, but God has given you works that he's prepared before for you. If you're true, as a true disciple, a true servant, you will faithfully act with what the king of the kingdom has entrusted you with. There is one who is given one talent, according to his ability. It's a million bucks. The implication is he is not a true disciple. The implication is he is not a true son of Abraham. He did not live daily doing what a true believer or a true disciple would do. For us today, Jesus' message is simple. He's coming. No problem. It could be tomorrow. It could be next month. We don't know. He's coming. Count on it. And judgment will come. There will be the judgment that we call the white throne judgment. But don't sit there and wait for the rapture. Don't sit there and just study end times and sit back and say, that's all you're going to do. Be his true servants. Be his true disciples. Remember this. In Matthew 24, starting in verse 42. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day the Lord, your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you will do not think he will. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave? Here it is. Who then is the, the faithful and sensible slave? whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Live each day continually as true servants, as true disciples. You're a true branch. We're, we're part of the true vine. We're branches of the vine. Why? Because we've been saved by grace. And we're growth that comes out of the true vine as a branch. And we are to bear fruit. We're not just supposed to sit there. And as we bear fruit, we prove, as Jesus said in John 15, to be his disciples. Be like your rabbi. Be his reflection in the world. That's what it means to be a disciple. You want to be like Jesus. You want to look at your rabbi and you want to imitate his actions. You want to be his reflection in the world. Live then. And in every moment and in every situation, in every test or trial, no matter what's, if it's small or great, always, always ask this question. Ma Yeshua. Hayah Ose. 
מה ישוע היה עושה? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And then, as a disciple, go and do it. Shalom. Shalom. 